tell me how this role came to be for you. Oh, this role was offered to me by the wonderful Stephen Muncha of the Elsinore Theater in, in an email, first and foremost. Stephen emailed me, reached out, and said, we at the Elsinore are thinking of doing this grand new production of Annie Get Your Gun. Would you be interested? And after I, I took a little bit to think about it, I called Stephen up because it was too big of a conversation to have via email. It was one that I definitely wanted to talk with him about. Wanted to hear his vision, wanted to conceptualize what this grand new production would be and, and how I could best fit into the role of Annie. And after that conversation, I was sold, absolutely sold. What is it about Annie that you've learned um, to love the most? Mm. She's, she's more of a multifaceted character. Annie is more of a multifaceted character than I originally gave her credit for. And after I had the opportunity to talk with uh, an Annie historian about her, I, and, and knowing her background in conjunction with how she has been portrayed all of these years in Annie Get Your Gun, I have a real respect for her talent, first and foremost, for her, her aptitude. She may have been, and, and how we portray her is as a little, little Hicktown girl from Ohio, but she was smart. She was very smart. She was athletic. She was agile. She, she knew what was going to be the best for her and what was going to be the best ultimately for her life as she continued to lead it long into her, her latter years. I love performing with my daughter in this production. Absolutely love it. It's, it's a rare treat, really, for me. Uh, I've been performing for over three-fourths of my life, and I have had one other occasion where I was able to perform with, with one of my children, and that was when my son was four years old, and I was doing uh, Mary and the Librarian in The Music Man, and he was one of the little boys band members. <laughs> and he was four years old, and little Victoria, who's in this production, was newly born. She was six months old when I did this production. So uh, being able to go to work with Tyler was a real treat. Now with Victoria being nine, almost 10 years old, and, and having seen uh, all of these productions that I've done during her lifetime, and having her have some some savvy some theater savvy some know-how now and seeing her input that into her little character it's it brings you know my mother's joy just at full blossom i love it but it's also a treat to to show her how you can be a multifaceted character and when i'm on stage i'm not mom I, i'm annie so she has to and is learning how to relate to me in that capacity as well, which is unusual. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about your background as far as uh, vocal goes. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I have a, a primarily a pedagogical approach to singing. So I'm, I consider myself kind of a vocal scientist. But I started out as this little girl in, in Gresham, Oregon. I was raised for half of my childhood in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and primarily a ballet background. And when I was five years old and my mom put me into classical ballet class at the, at the Charlotte Ballet Academy, I was too busy paying attention to our class accompanist and the gorgeous music that was coming from her fingers than I was necessarily at my feet. <laughs> but I loved dancing. I loved simply performing, being on stage, being, being connected with music in general. So when we moved from Charlotte to Portland, Oregon, and I'm, I will make sure to clarify that I'm an Oregonian. I was born in Portland, raised for those first four years in Oregon, but my father worked for Freightliner Trucks for over 40 years, and he was part of a satellite operation that brought us to Charlotte, and then after eight years, brought us back. Wow. So when we moved back to Oregon, and uh, I, it, this is the most crazy off the wall story out there, but I participated in a little musical in the fifth grade in my elementary school, and a voice teacher, a very prominent, beloved voice teacher from the community, happened to be in the audience. And after that musical performance, uh, which I had 
I sang in church, things like that. I didn't publicly sing. I sang in the shower and at home, like any little girl does. But she was in the audience and she came up to my parents afterwards and said, does Katie have any interest in, in taking voice lessons? And my mother, in all seriousness, looked at her and said, are you sure you need voice lessons to sing? Isn't that something we can all do? <laughs> Make a joyful noise, right? And, and Janine was so kind, she said, I really, I see something in your daughter and I really want to, to work with her. And I am so grateful that Janine stepped forth and talked to my parents and that my parents agreed. And from that time forward, I was 10 years old, so the same age as my daughter is almost now. 10 years old, I started pri private voice lessons with Janine Kirstein, and I stayed with Janine all the way through high school. And she knew that the music that she was feeding me fed my soul. I couldn't get enough of it, and, and she would feed me more and more and more classical music, little art songs, little arias, little ariettas, and, and eventually um, that grew into a, a full passion, and I was performing um, you know, all, as much as I possibly could. When I went to college, that became uh, my career passion. That became something that I, I wanted to guide the rest of my life toward. And Miss America is really what opened the door for that, though. I consider that the biggest audition. 24 million people watching you in that telecast. <laughs> And you're, you're singing in front of this audience of 50,000 that are seated in Boardwalk Hall. And the, the phone calls and the opportunities that I garnered from that um, started the, the trajectory of my performance career. And I, I could not be more grateful. What was that moment like? I, I would call it iconic, I think, for many reasons, not only for you personally, but I think for the country, given what had, mm. you know, you took the crown um, very soon after 9 11. Mm. And anytime I watch your performance at Miss America, it gives me chills. And I think it gives a lot of people chills because it was just like time stopped in that <sighs> moment. What was it like for you? It's very kind to hear you say that. <laughs> it, it was a time stopping moment for me. I think the entire experience was a little bit out of body, but what made it so much more real was the impact of 9-11 on um, my being in participation in, in the Miss America pageant at that time. So backing up just a little bit, 9-11 happened on our very first day of rehearsal. And for us contestants, that being our first day of rehearsal, we were also expected to kind of be pretty quarantined. You know, you're cut off from all media. You're, you've got limited I exposure to what's kind of happening on, happening around you, um, and that's partly a protective thing that Miss America, the organization, does for their girls. Now, so that's totally out the window with social media. <laughs> the girls have their phones right. attached to them at all times. We didn't at that time. This was still kind of pre-cell phone era. But um, we didn't really have any exposure to what was happening around us, and, and I didn't have an opportunity to really contact my parents, that sort of a thing. So we knew what was happening because a security guard actually came into our dressing room and told us that a tower, you know, one of the World Trade Center towers had been hit in New York City. And that didn't really register with me. I was a small town girl from Oregon. I had never been to New York City. I, I had no idea the scope and the breadth and the depth of, of what happened in New York City. And it wasn't until contestants who had still been at their hotels and had not started rehearsal yet came back into the dressing rooms, their, their faces just stained with tears. They had seen the footage. Um, it wasn't until I saw them that I started to really understand the scope of what was happening. And then just shortly thereafter, when uh, we were all called together as a group and ABC Network Television, who was broadcasting the show, and the Miss America Organization executives, they gathered us together and said, we, we're really not sure what's going to happen at this point. Uh, we need you to be prepared that there might not be a Miss America pageant. We don't know. We're trying to figure out what to do with you girls, you ladies, 51 of us from spread all out throughout the United States. We're trying to contact your parents. We're, we're trying to figure out from a television perspective uh, what to do because at that point, uh, all network television, all live television events, all live events in general were halted. 
as they should have been. We were all, as American citizens, terrified. We had no idea what was going to happen next. You've got this chain reaction of things happening, and, and everyone was terrified. And after, after we were gathered, um, we learned that uh, one of our prominent Miss America executives, um, one of our, our field directors, uh, her cousin, who was her closest living relative after she had lost her husband, was one of the pilots in, in one of the planes. And all of a sudden, whoom, that experience became so much more real. All of a sudden, we knew of people who were lost. We had friends, we had family members, we had loved ones who were, who were integrated, you know, tightly wound in this experience. And it made uh, us question what Miss America could possibly do to help it during such a time. And I, being in entertainment as long as I have now, I know that I will never, ever encounter a, a similar experience to this, but ABC, the next day on September 12th, came to us as contestants and asked us whether we wanted to continue with competition or not, whether we wanted to continue. You know, $40 million production, whatever, however much it, it takes to put on a production like that, and, and sponsorships and that, those types of things, and they're looking to the talent, quote unquote, to make the decision. But they did so so sensitively because they knew that one of us would be traveling the nation and the world that year following uh, as an ambassador, as someone who represented the, the American dream, because that's what Miss America is. That's what it has always been, is not only representative of, of what uh, women's advancement can and, and should be, but it's the American dream, right? To, to achieve an education, to, to finance that education, to achieve what it is that you want in life, that's what Miss America has done for almost 100 years now. So ABC knew that. They've been watching this for almost 50, you know, over 50 years at that point. They had seen how the telecast had brought the American dream into the homes and the hearts of, of people around the U.S. And so in giving us that decision, it really gave us the power to, to understand the situation fully, as fully as possible. And for me, continuing with the pageant was an opportunity to, to give hope to those who really needed it. And that was the entire nation at that time, to give hope, to, to be kind of a beacon of, of healing during that time. So when given that opportunity, oh, I was, I was honored. I was beyond honored. So that night of the final telecast of competition, for me, was this opportunity to be part of something so much bigger than myself. I, I, it was not just me wearing the crown during that year. The, the, everyone, the entire nation was wearing that crown. Yeah. I, I, what made that relevant, what made my entire year relevant, uh, and, and my life, really, now, living, you, you're never just Miss America for one year, you're Miss America for your life. Uh, so we've had people hearken it to, or, or liken it to, to that of a presidency, which, that's big stuff. You know, Miss America's not quite a presidency, I'm, I'm savvy enough to know that. But you're a president for life, you're Miss America for life. But they, just two days after being crowned, I was at ground zero. I was given the opportunity by the USO to, to visit with rescue workers and officials who were helping in the rescue effort. And I was brought first to a, uh, a respite facility, which was a boat, you know, the, the wonderful little, the, they're all little, but the big cruise boats that docked there in the harbor providing food and, and shelter and, and breakfast and lunch and dinner for rescue workers as they were helping at Ground Zero. So I was taken first to one of those boats, the, the Spirit of New York, one of those. And I was taken around and I was meeting with various rescue workers and they're, you know, they've been there for 24, 48 hours on, on these long shifts. They've seen so much. And I was taken to a, a table of, of three gentlemen who had been working a 48-hour shift, and they were ashen, covered, you know, covered with, with uh, all all of the the things that we saw, at Ground Zero, and I was stunned when immediately one of them looked at me and said, oh, 
I watched you. My wife made me sit down and watch the Miss America pageant. You know, they've got the accent. So he's telling me this, and I am just staring back at him, marveling at the fact that this man, who has been in the midst of the biggest recovery effort in American history, sat down, watched the Miss America pageant, and he said, you know what, I needed to see that. I was blown away, totally blown away. He said, that's what I needed. My wife knew. He said, watching that, that was what all of America needs. America needed to see that Miss America pageant was still on TV. Yeah. That these things, these American institutions that we love so much, were not going to stop. That terrorism was not going to bring down the, the fabric of the American dream. How did you hold it together during oh! to hold it together that's for sure it was one of those moments where I um, prof your professionalism kicks in your training kicks in and this was so much more about them than it was about me I didn't it took me years to process that but I hold that so dear to my heart anytime anyone asks about the relevancy of being Miss America and Miss America pageant that's the story and I'll tell you one other thing too as a, as a performer during that time, being Miss America during, during the era of 9-11, that next week I was brought to the Pentagon to meet with political officials, but mo more importantly, to meet with the families of those who had been lost both uh, in the airplane and at the Pentagon. And they were being housed at the Sheraton Crystal City. The, the hotel had closed their doors to everyone but those families. And I was brought in by General John Van Alstine, who, was, who came out of retirement to, to run this operation for these families. I was brought in by him to speak with the families and to sing for them. And he asked me to sing God Bless America. And I, as a performer, you, you do what you've got to do. When you're called upon to yeah. perform, you, you do everything in your power to, to give what is being asked of you. And that was one of those moments where I looked at these families, and for two weeks they had been reliving the hell and the horror of, of what had been experienced. And to sing this for them, with them, was the most important performance I have ever given in my life because it was it was one of those moments where I knew that the words meant so much more than than just the notes and and the experience itself as they were singing with me it was an opportunity really to to knit together for all of us to to come together to empathize to to appreciate the blessings of, of being together, but also to, to be empowered in what was to come. So Miss America gave me experiences like that. And really, I, everything that I do from this point forward is in, in immense gratitude because of what I have seen. I grew up so much in my little 21-year-old state <laughs> during that time. Whew. And you are the only Miss Oregon to have won the crown, correct? That is correct. What is that like? I mean, that's even more to carry with you. Oh, my goodness. Well, this is, Oregon is such an incredible state to be from. Oregonians were fiercely proud. We, we see this constantly. We are, we're self-reliant people. It, comes, it goes back to our nature, right? <laughs> when you think about the first settlers here, when you think about the, the native peoples who, who are our first Oregonians here, and the culmination of, of pioneers who settled in Oregon, they didn't, they didn't come to just sit back and prop their feet up. They came here to build a better life. And so that attitude and that, that reliance on, on your strengths and, and your determination and the land uh, has never died. So being, being Miss Oregon and then Miss America, I was fiercely proud of that. And then to see how Oregon embraced me, I, I was blown away. Absolutely blown to away day, to this day. To this day, I'm always surprised at that. Though I, it's, it always kind of takes me aback if I'm in the grocery store and, and someone remembers. It, it 
just makes me so appreciative that, that people have the same reverence for this that, that I do. It just, it really, really warms my heart. I really appreciate it. What I love about taking on this role of Annie Oakley as a lyric soprano is that I get the opportunity to be a little goofy. So they're going to see that more in, in Katie's portrayal of this than they get to see in, in my other shows and in the other things that I've done thus far. Mary and the Librarian would definitely be the closest kind of um, character to this. But Annie Oakley is a complete portrayal of something totally unique in all of musical theater. I don't think there's anything that really compares to this. So they're going to see that. But I love being able to fuse my, my classical training and, and what I love most about operatic singing and, and classical singing with what I love most about musical thing, theater singing, and that's storytelling. I love that about this show. This music, you know, Irving Berlin had the most classically singable tunes of all time, right? So we go around singing these songs, not necessarily even knowing where they're from. So coming into this show, when people hear the music in the show, they're going to all of a sudden think, oh my goodness, I know this song. I know this song and this song and this song. And I love that about taking on this show because it's singable and it's fun. It is nonstop laughter, fun, smiles from the minute that curtain goes up to the minute that we close this show. What do you think about the Elsinore? Oh, to perform in the El Elsinore is a dream. Any, being in the Elsinore is a performer's dream. Not only because of the history and obviously the beauty. The beauty, when you see it, when you walk through the doors of the, the main lobby of the Elsinore, you can't help but be captivated by just it, its grandeur and its beauty. And then when you walk through to see the stage, to be in the house and the auditorium itself, you, you're just kind of awash with history with the magnitude of, of the love that went into building this theater and preserving the theater. So to be on stage performing in such a place, such a work as Annie Get Your Gun, it is, it's a dream come true. What do you want the takeaway feeling or message to be uh, for people who come to see the show? I want the takeaway message for the audience when they come to see this show is that anything is possible. As cliche as that is, we all love it. We all want to hear it. And Annie Oakley is the living example of that. This little girl from small town America had such great skill and gumption and determination. And there were also people savvy enough around her to, to know that this is what America loves. This is the fabric of America, is, uh, shows like this, uh, stories of, of great accomplishment. Uh, seeing that on stage is just so wonderful, but it, in the middle of this is also a really great love story that Annie Oakley and Frank Butler were two of the greatest lovers in all of, of history. When we, the, the truth in that is what's so wonderful in that it's so wonderfully encapsulated in this show. Our, when we met with the Annie historian and she told us that they died just two weeks apart. She died first and then he died two weeks later, literally of a broken heart. It, it's, it's one of the greatest love stories and you get to see that unfold. I, I love performing with Rob Harrison because he is, he's a performer's performer. He knows what he's doing. He's so much fun to act with. I get to be really, really angry at him on stage and he just takes it, which is so great. But there's this great interplay between the Frank and the Annie character that, that shows you that love is so much more multifaceted than, than the googly-eyed initial stuff. You can see the, the gumption in these two characters that really lends to their real life love story and what kept them and knitted them together for the rest of their lives.